Okay, so uh, today's discussion, I wanted to um, focus on frontiers of dynamic modeling. We've systematically gone through in this course, um, a set of material on sort of the philosophy of uh, system science and, and dynamic modeling. Um, this idea that um, of, of focusing on mechanisms, uh, context and outcomes, understanding the world as, as consisting of a set of, uh, of uh, dynamically evolving processes, which are typically entangled with each other. Um, and where context really matters uh, for, for how they evolve. The current state of the system really matters. Um, and where, when we see different um, data from the world, for example, different types of evidence, we, we kind of tend to view it as, as different faces of an underlying situation, which often we know only incompletely. And, uh, and this leads to a certain uh, philosophy or, or sort of perspective on things in the world, which is a lot broader than traditionally brought by uh, reductionist uh, perspectives, where you're kind of studying each thing in isolation and where to get to its essence, you believe you take it apart into these pieces and you understand each piece. Um, and what you know, science has, has really shown, particularly in the past quarter century, is just how much um, that process, while very valuable, extremely important and essential, in fact, um, it, it doesn't account for something of equal importance, which is how all these pieces combine together to yield behavior for the whole. And what we've seen in this class, uh, whether it's in interactions of stocks and flows in, in system dynamics or interaction of agents within the context of agent-based modeling or, or associated with dynamics and in uh, service, uh, service provision within the context of discrete event simulation is that, you know, there are these phenomena that are observed in the world and in these models, which characterize salient features in the world, which can't be reduced to just their pieces in isolation. They can't be reduced to just the average of all the pieces or summing up all these pieces. It's more than a heap of stuff, you know, just piled up um, a system. It's, um, it often has a life of its own. It, there's a science of the whole, which is, is what complexity science or system science, I use those terms pretty much interchangeably, um, brings us. And we've seen how these three types of dynamic modeling disciplines, system dynamics, agent-based modeling, discrete event simulation, each um, provide a lens to understand uh, systems which, uh, particularly systems which have certain notable features uh, associated with them. And they bring out and uh, allow us to more easily study uh, these aspects of the system. And it's not because these models are right or they're crystal balls, um, that they're guaranteed arbiters of truth, but rather um, they help us as thinking tools. And uh, it's not that they're, uh, always giving the correct answer, but they, they help us in our thinking realize where we're off base more quickly. Um, really, that's their, you know, their foremost strength. Um, and uh, you could say when it comes to decision-making about complex systems, COVID-19 included, they're the worst of all options to use dynamic modeling, except for everything else. Um, we don't have anything that compares with what we get out of dynamic modeling. And what's really important is to, um, to approach them from a position of, of, of humbleness and humility and realize that they are not, no matter how intricately constructed, no matter how much effort has been put into them, um, they're an imperfect representation of things in the world. And we, that um, their very job is to help us learn where we're off base more quickly so that we could remedy that. Now that is a, uh, a philosophy of life um, that I would recommend to any of you. And we'll come back to this at the end of the course, but uh, you know, the end of this lecture, but the, the basic reflection is we can turn what would shallowly be viewed as a failure um, into a success uh, 
uh, a failure in terms of achieving some goal or, or expecting some behavior and being disappointed is actually a success if it can be rendered into learning, if it can be rendered into you know, saying, how can I do better next time? And it's not a matter of self-castigation. It's, it's asking, you know, how, how could I do this better next time? How could I have prevented that? Or how could I have spotted the error quicker? And in and, and building on that, to always, always push ourselves harder uh, as people and, um, and as modelers. And uh, this is a learning discipline, uh, system science. So today I, I listed together from my perspective as, as a, um, a leading researcher in this area, um, uh, kind of perspectives on, on what are some major modeling frontiers within this area. And you folks are learning these tools, the tools of the trade, as it were, the concepts um, at a very special time. Um, at a time where there's widespread recognition, not only acceptance of these tools, but a recognition of how, core, how critically needed they are. And yet a tremendous shortage of people who can effectively wield them with skill and um, with, uh, with education to achieve, um, to achieve goals and in a team context, an interdisciplinary team context, as needed to solve the world's biggest problems, which are these tangled problems, these, these problems that are, are uh, dynamically complex and uh, require a systems perspective. So um, in today's lecture, I'm going to be going through in a whirlwind way a bunch of these uh, frontiers associated with dynamic modeling. And not surprisingly, um, these are frontiers in which our group and, and many others are working. Um, and um, they are rapidly advancing. And what it means is that the system science you folks could practice, you know, will be very different uh, than what I practiced at your age. Um, and uh, that opens up a tremendous amount of opportunities. So let's, uh, you know, get, um, get the, um, the show on the road here. Uh, I am going to switch over to my, um, my comments. Um, so here we go. Uh, share the screen. Great. Um, okay, so these thoughts were pulled together, um, admittedly, rather quickly. Um, I, but I, I hope it'll lend you some flavors of, of some major modeling frontiers. And the way I've organized it is as kind of a, a listing of, of what I view as kind of core um, needs and opportunities associated with uh, with dynamic modeling. Areas where there's tremendous uh, ferment um, in, and um, in activity or, or need and, and uh, some early activity to address. One of them we talked about just uh, three lectures ago, and I, I won't go into it um, uh, much at all, but it's multi-scale and hybrid modeling. And you know, the reflection I left you with at, at that point was, look, th these different system science methodologies, which seem such solitudes from each other, they seem to be totally different lenses for viewing the world. They're in fact, highly complementary. And uh, in that lecture, I showed you a set of uh, five compelling patterns that uh, by which these, uh, these methodologies can be woven together. Um, whether it's you know agents seeking care and, and discrete event simulations, or whether it's aspects of using system dynamics to record amounts of environmental contamination at certain places, um, or having agents produced from a system dynamics model kind of spat out by a flow at a certain rate. Um, there's a lot of op opportunities here for complementarity. And in my generation, um, these were the things of, of almost religious wars between different uh, schools of system science modeling. And you still see that a little bit where, you know, the different schools kind of strut their stuff and, and often belittle others, which whose, whose techniques they don't really understand typically. Um, I hope that your exposure, which is almost unique worldwide in one class to three types um, will lend you a certain breadth of, of understanding. But even though we work with this tool, any logic which allows, you know, an impressive way of, of building these, these types of models together, 
there's a lot of challenges. Uh, performance large-scale hybrid modeling is still more a black art than it is a, um, a reality. Um, really high performance um, hybrid modeling. Um, you know, if you have a part of your model in one framework, say in a system dynamics model, you want to move it to an eggs-based model. It's a tremendous amount of kind of rebuilding you got to do. And, and a lot of it's kind of boilerplate-ish. It's kind of transliteration, but it's, it's needed. Um, and, you know, we can do better than that. Um, uh, also, there's a need for the seamless uh, interfacing. This model that spat out agents from these flows. I mean, uh, I mean, it was kind of a hack. Um, it, it's useful. We use it. I mean, it's, it's, it's not like it's incredibly problematic, but it's, you know, it, it, it lacks um, um, elegance in its characterization. It's kind of dealing with the, the vagaries of the of just details where really it should be described at a higher level um, in a way it could be optimized, transformed, et cetera. Um, and there's a lot of other, um, other issues here where, um, you know, you could, for example, have, um, have system dynamics models that are only active when an agent's in a certain state chart, for a state in a state chart. And that's not really supported right now. So Multi-scale and hybrid modeling has a lot of needs associated with it. And even what are the best use cases? Um, it's amazing how few people are actually systematically listing these things, but I think it's because of so few that have experience with multiple methods. And there's just, it's, the sky like in Saskatchewan is wide open in that area. But so it is in this other area too, linking dynamic simulation in machine learning tools. And we saw some of this uh, last time, right? Uh, uh, in, in terms of um, linking up uh, data coming in from wastewater as well as um, uh, health system into uh, simulation models. And um, this, is, uh, this is one of the big opportunities here. And it's one um, which is, uh, is quickly gaining a lot of attention, uh, both, both in Canada and worldwide. But uh, beyond that, there's, there's a lot of opportunities here um, reflective of, of a fact that we build models that are often very sophisticated. Um, let's put it this way. The, the constraints in representing rich behavior, representing um, uh, at, a, at a very detailed level aspects of context that may be germane to health or, or other aspects of human behavior, um, uh, the constraints there are not predominantly ones of characterizing it in a model. It's really our understanding of what's going on in the world at that level. I can't tell you how many, how many hours, I mean, it, it, it would be shocking if you were to know, um, were spent in meetings with our ministry, with our health authority, you know, speculating about human behavior throughout the province, about mask wearing, about social distancing, about vaccine uptake, and many other spheres. And the truth is that our models, I, I hope you are convinced now, I mean, our models are as, as ways of specifying dynamic systems. I mean, we can specify all sorts of things about location or, or people's proximity and, and networks and communication between them with these captured in messages, um, we could represent decision-making. The real problem is that often, often there's really not a lot of evidence to drive those things at a really detailed level. Whether it comes to how much people are moving around in the province, uh, their relative proximity to each other, uh, what their attitudes are to masks, what their attitudes are to vaccination. Um, there's, you know, with traditional data sources like StatsCan surveys, that you might fill out once a year, um, you know, there's there's really little information, and the and the problem is that you know, absent an understanding here, the ability to quantitatively evaluate like policy trade-offs in these models is limited. We we're compromised in our ability to reliably describe these systems. Now, you folks are living at a privileged time, um, and it reflects the fact that we are um, without question in an age of big data. Um, there's good, good things and not so good things about this, but when it comes to things like health behavior, which is 
been an exemplar area which we've applied, um, there's just this explosion of, of, of sources of information that are non-traditional, but very potent when it comes to understanding things like, like these factors here. And we're gonna go see a uh, number of features of those, but what distinguishes big data? And it is a buzzword that, you, that is overused, often abused, and um, sometimes so diluted in meaning it, it doesn't really carry a lot of water. Uh, I like to distinguish it using the so-called four V, sometimes extended with a fifth in a, in a business context. This was coined by Google to the best of my knowledge, um, but it says, look, what, what these share, what all of these features share, besides being electronic um, in their, their origins, they share volume. That's kind of the big and big data. They share velocity. The data is coming in very quickly compared to, you know, we used to depend on surveys from StatsCan that be conducted once a year. And you may be getting data from Twitter, you know, Twitter posts in Saskatoon every few seconds. Um, you may be getting data from smartphones, for example, or Fitbits, you know, um, uh, every few minutes in batches. Um, uh, you may get, be getting point of sale data from pharmacies on, on you know, the, the sale of mosquito repellents um, uh, that are coming in every day. You're getting reports on purchasing. So the velocity is very high compared to traditional types. Wastewater, you know, we get it thrice a week, but other jurisdictions may get it once a day. Um, but they're also characterized by variety, like from a smartphone, you can get information on my location, information on, on my, my going online, what, what I'm browsing, if I were to share that. Um, I could, you could get information about my level of physical activity from the accelerometers on that. Uh, you can get uh, understanding of how often the screen is on and how much I'm using my phone. Um, you can get information on my proximity to certain beacons um, uh, and on some platforms, proximity to Wi-Fi access points, et cetera. There's a, a lot of variety you get from a Twitter feed. You can get a lot of variety about types of information, not only the cute text, but uh, emoticons and likes and, and all sorts of other things. And finally, for many things, um, uh, such as reports of food intake or reports of physical activity or reports on where I've gone or reports on who I've been with, uh, it turns out we can get more reliable data from mobile devices typically with consent than we can with um, from traditional burdensome surveys. And partly it's because they're burdensome, partly because uh, my memory is off. Where did I eat over the past year for a stats can survey? Uh, or if, if there's been a foodborne illness outbreak and I've gotten terribly sick, where have I eaten the past 21 days? Um, um, harder than you think. So the thesis here is the advent of big data synergizes with and fundamentally will alter dynamic modeling. Um, and it's already altering it in a big way. And there's a natural synergy here, like big data helps us ground our models, provides databases to parameterize our assumptions and calibration and keep the models updated in that particle filtering way we saw last time regrounded. Um, but it can also stimulate hypotheses for representation of the model. The model by contrast helps us make sense of this data. What is this data telling us about the underlying situation? These are all fast data, testifying to some underlying situation. What situation makes sense that would give rise to all this data? Um, it lets us kind of filter out noisy data, um, lets us uh, better understand where this is going, where it might go as we simulate forward, for example, understand uh, what if questions with the models um, and it helps fill in the gaps between these things um, from the wastewater data we use it to infer how many uninfected people there are out there, or sorry, how many people there are out there who are infected but not reported. Uh, and, and that helps explain successive days data as well. So there's this natural synergy. Um, there's many types of this data. Search data is, is, is one that you folks may be familiar with from many years ago. There was this Google flu trends, which only had very simple statistical uses, but already showed 
sort of the value. But you know, if you look at how people search for certain health conditions like whooping cough, you can see dramatic shifts associated with public shifts in awareness. Um, this from Australia, the case of baby Riley, an unvaccinated baby who uh, tragically uh, died from pertussis contracted from a family member. Um, and it totally shifted public discourse. This is going month by month by month. And you can see the kind of public awareness as manifested in search data uh, showed, showed um, you know, a, a difference before and after that case. Naloxone, um, an antagonist to stop overdoses uh, for opioids here in Canada, for example. Electronic cigarette searches um, went crazy at some point as use uh, started to, to go up and, and interest started to go up. Um, and you know, if you look at COVID-19, what you'll see is there are these kind of phases um, by which people search for it, you know, hearing about an outbreak and uh, searching, uh, searching information uh, on, on lockdown and, and uh, what does that mean in terms of activity and so on searching what are symptoms associated with this and you know how do i how do i make a mask for example there's this uh, this uh, phasing associated with it um uh and if you look at searches uh, over the covid-19 pandemic for different periods of time you'll find them the nature of the searches will reflect kind of the um uh you know, what's going on in different areas. So like as this peak came up, you'll notice it was associated with searching for Hutterite colony, as, which were, which had outbreaks associated with them as well as um, some other communities in the, in the Southwest and then Southeast. Um, or, or during this time, uh, there was uh, an outbreak in the North. Um, uh, here, there was a bit of an outbreak in Saskatoon. You saw the number of, of uh, spikes associated with it um, rise. Uh, so, so this is search data and, and there's some fascinating patterns. In fact, Google maintains a whole COVID-19 area of their search, you know, Google Trends site, which, which focuses on that. Another area though is social media. All of you are familiar with these. Uh, uh, you're you're uh, likely on several social media platforms. And broadly, you know, we can classify them as to kind of how much effort it takes to kind of make sense of them computationally, the data on there, and then uh, the degree of privacy and security concerns associated with it. Uh, so we don't do a lot of data collection by Facebook because you know it requires us going and getting consent for every single uh, individual, and it's um, it's readily doable. We can screen scrape, but for screen scrape from it, but for um, ethics reasons, we have to be very careful. By contrast, Twitter is a self-publishing platform. It's really easy to capture it, just like it is from Reddit or Tumblr. And uh, people put the tweets out with expectations that they'll be used widely and consulted widely. So, um, you know, there's a set of these platforms that indicate kind of self-publishing platforms, which can be harvested, but some of them are hard, harder to use than others. You know, Twitter is an incredibly abundant source of information. And these days there's about, you know, between five and 10,000 tweets per second. This is a bit outdated now. Um, and about 3% of those tweets are health related, by the way. Um, we have um, hundreds of millions of those tweets from Canada and, and from Saskatchewan back to 2016. And, you know, there's all sorts of discourse uh, captured there. This is from COVID-19. Um, and, um, this, these are from earlier in the COVID-19 pandemic, as you might, uh, uh, might, might guess. Here's someone commenting on someone wearing, wearing a crocheted mask, um, which uh, I can assure you is not that effective. Um, and there was you know, a huge increase in discussion and then some fatigue, but it's actually gone uh, ebbed and float. This is only till about August, but it's ebbed and float. And if you look at kind of the discourse, this, uh, we, we did this, uh, my student Janelle Bershad, who's a real, uh, real leader um, in this area, um, applied uh, topic uh, identification algorithms to tweets from Saskatchewan um, at different times. And you can see you know, tremendous variability over time in COVID-19 related tweets, what the topics are, right? Early on, toilet paper, um, and crews and, um, 
and you know Italy and and um, you know questions about uh, quarantining and the break, outbreak in Iran, et cetera. Um, by you know May and June, you're getting into quarantines and and you know protests and um, uh, and and this was during a time of of um, uh, some of the George Floyd uh, protests in the states uh, uh, involving um, uh, involving issues of uh, structural racism. Um, but you also see a, a shift to awareness of, uh, for example, masks and the, the, the importance of masks later in the summer. So you can take these tweets and kind of run these um, topic analysis algorithms and find how discourse is changing. You can also use this sort of information to help um, organizations, whether it's uh, public authorities like the, uh, the health authority or, or smaller organizations like the Lung Association better shape their messaging and address uh, concerns brought up or counter messaging. So that's another type of, of big data. Another type is, um, we've been pioneering this for since uh, the H1M pandemic, which probably occurred before Maybe uh, certainly you, you folks were a lot smaller then, um, but it was uh, 2009, 2010. It was a pandemic and it struck Saskatchewan reasonably hard. Um, it was much smaller than COVID-19 and much less serious, but, but still serious. And, and we built our first uh, mobile data collection systems there to record people's proximity in our very department and uh, found people over a three month period, all their contacts on a minute by minute type of basis. Um, these days, we make heavy, heavy use of wearables and, um, and smartphones. And we have a system that's spun off uh, from, from our lab um, called Ethica Data, which uh, allows for really easy configuring um, for those seeking to make studies, which include uh, public authorities as well as, uh, as researchers. They can configure studies very easily without programming. and. Uh, and people could specify what data sources they want to collect, GPS, uh, contact patterns, aspects associated with physical activity, um, components associated with uh, screen use, what have you. Um, you have these data sources you can enable or as you, you know, see fit, you have surveys, you have um, additional extensions like chatting interface for people to chat with organizers, etc. cetera. And uh, you have to go through uh, ethics uh, process almost always for these sort of studies. Um, and you can recruit people and they can use their smartphones or web-based app to use, use it and, and provide data. And there's a lot of types of data we can collect which are exactly geared to inform our models. Um, uh, these data have, again, different privacy concerns and difficulty of analyses, but they can be very instructive for informing our models as to what's going on and helping our models track what's going on and posit what's going on under the covers, like with a um, with a, a, a particle filtering model. So here, for example, we have um, individuals, um, lower lower um, income individuals, recruited in Houston, Texas, through a collaboration with Harvard School of Public Health and Baylor College of Medicine. Um, and individuals are circulating and over time, I, I don't have the graph uh, here, but over time they're being exposed to tobacco related messages, which are still up in billboards on the states. And uh, they are exposed to messaging in gas stations and bars for purchasing cigarettes. And they were recording that and recording exposures and, um, and we were relating it to their smoking behavior, which is something incidentally we can detect pretty well using uh, smartphone behavior, looking when people go outside, for example, when they're pacing around outside, et cetera. Um, you can look at people's contact patterns over time. This from Saskatoon, of course, uh, predominantly graduate students um, about 10 years ago, uh, you know, during the day and uh, different times of day, essentially for different uh, individuals where they were having contacts with other individuals as measured by proximity of smartphones of others in the study who had consented. You can have reporting from these studies, uh, which of course can include lots of things like audio and visual, uh, video and, and photos that a smartphone can record and you can capture people's movements over time at an individual level or kind of an aggregate and heat map. So this is the messaging for, for Houston and where they encountered different sorts of messaging. 
we can keep track of changing contact patterns. Think about those networks that we can characterize in agent-based modeling. Where do we get data for those? Well, these days we can capture it. And you know, it used to be we could do it readily with smartphone to smartphone connections. These days it's smartphone to beacon collections, but we've done this in spades for infectious disease transmission. We've also done it for um, things like understanding team-based care in hospitals and, and you know, um, the degree to which patterns shift within a hospital when there's, um, uh, when there's been a change in environment, to what degree there's more effective grouping of interdisciplinary people like nurses and occupational therapists and physicians and physiotherapists, et cetera, in teams that, that can work and, and help to stabilize the whole patient um, as, a, as a whole person rather than each dealing with it separately, deal with that person separately. So we can look at how contacts evolve over time Within teams, we can look at it within um, uh, within uh, broader people circulating and relate that to infectious disease transmission. And what this gives you is kind of a picture over time at an individual level as to what's going on. This is from a study we do with uh, sociologist Colleen Dell on service dogs for veterans with PTSD. And uh, the veterans carried Ethica as well as um, having uh, um, Fitbits as well as uh, having their dog, their service dog, outfitted with a collar which had a Bluetooth beacon on it. So we can keep track of how much time they're spending with dogs. We can look at how does that, how does that vary with uh, veteran sleep patterns or, or occurrences of flashback. These dogs are just amazing. They can interfere with flashbacks. They recognize the specific signs of flashback for this veteran and they can interfere, wake the veteran up before the flashback really starts in earnest. Um, they can deal with help help detect signs of stress and intervene on the on the veteran. And one of the things we're interested in doing is building models of this. But we need some textured understanding of of what's going on, and that's what these these um, these types of tools can give us an understanding of when they're you know using cigarettes and social engagement and poor sleep and level of physical activity they're getting and how much time they're spending around others or how much time they're spending around the dog. And what that really allows us to do is, this is a causal loop diagram, which I flashed up at you at one point early in the class. It's a form of qualitative model mapping, but basically it allows us to pin down um, a lot more what's going on under the covers with our study population. In this case, veterans with PTSD and, and, and substance use um, compared to traditional sources, which um, are shown in gray, the, the Big data sources can give us these, these sort of red ones. And all of this is, of course, with informed consent. In fact, it's a veteran-led study. But it starts to give us a better picture of what's going on. So we can better understand how do, how do service dogs actually help? And by extension, can we improve that uh, level of impact? So this type of data collection can, can really inform all of these sorts of areas, which are often big question marks in our models from traditional data sources. But another part of this is you know, putting our models together with data. And some of that data goes into parameterization, some to calibration, some for this kind of constant updating of, of the state of the model with particles, like in particle filtering and particle MCMC. Um, and uh, you know, in other cases, we use it to kind of um, uh, help help evaluate the accuracy of these models or scrutinize them for how they could be approved, build hypotheses that don't seem to be accounted for um, uh, by the current model for what we see in the data. Data from Google search, for example, by connecting it with models and kind of characterizing not only when people are sick, but when they are uh, concerned enough to, to search, for example, or to tweet, we can take a particle filter model that performs poorly with clinical data alone, and we can ground it using search volume data. And you might think this search volume data, you gotta be kidding. It's really noisy. It's, people could search for all sorts of reasons. I mean, how could that help? Well, it turns out it's an independent source of information that's, that can still give you quite a bit of information on on the underlying situation, if you model it explicitly, if you model people's interest as a kind of phenomenon, as a contagion, as it were. 
And so you do that. And what you find is that a model that considers this extra lower quality data, um, it's not like it's diluted and gets even worse. It, it can get better. It, it, that data provides extra information. Yes, the information is of somewhat lower quality than clinically validated H1N1 cases, but it allows the model, so this particle filtering model to predict much better what's gonna be coming in terms of clinical cases. That's the amazing thing in terms of clinical cases. It lets you much better understand what's going on under the covers of the system that's giving rise to both searching and to, and to spread of infection. Um, now, there's another frontier, which I don't have a slide on here, but it's really exciting. This is like next generation stuff, which is, look, to what degree can we turn data from these rich data sources into models to some degree automatically inferring what the governing processes must be, like what rules must govern these processes in the world to explain this data. And there's some really exciting work going on um, at university as well, at University of Washington, as well as other places um, uh, in terms of inferring about the underlying processes, like essentially deducing model structure, deducing a system dynamics model, for example, which best accounts for what we see in the data. And uh, that, that's extremely interesting work. It is not easy work and it requires often running counterfactual situations where you say, okay, we're gonna have a, a sort of, uh, we're gonna observe this system. Um, I shouldn't say this is counterfactual, but we're gonna intervene and see, and see how that affects things. So you have interventions and it provides extra information for it. Um, we've done some work um, using uh, some related things, looking at how features of time series, if you look at them in the right way, um, using something called uh, uh, convergent cross mapping, you can deduce causality, like what is driving what in a rigorous way. Um, that's another use of it. You can also look at features of that and figure out how, how complex does a model have to be? What is its kind of size of its state space to account for this data? To a degree, you can do that. Um, okay, another thing though I wanna talk about is another in, uh, area of investment in our work. And unfortunately it's, it's amazing that we don't see this more heavily invested in across, uh, across tool makers like uh, AnyLogic. Um, tried to get them to work on this back in 2014 or 15 and um, still dragging their feet. Um, the idea here is, uh, look, modeling, it takes a village to build a good model. Good models are built through interdisciplinary collaborations because they typically deal with problems that are tangled things that, that, that don't fit into any one discipline and where you need expertise computationally, but also from domain experts of various sorts. And um, uh, in this context, um, there's a need to make models accessible to team members. Traditionally, the, the, the situation has been, if you look back over the past 30 years, it's overwhelmingly been the modelers sort of control the model and they ask questions and they put it into the model and it's all Greek to the, to the rest of the members of the team and they just hope the modelers captured it right. But increasingly, and this is one of the reasons we use any logic as well, you know, these tools seek to have visual representations that are at least critiquable by other experts because modeling is about learning and a good model is one that gets that elicits critique so it can be shaped for the better um it's it's about that constant learning how to improve the situation i opened uh, with today and um here to enable team-based modeling we can do a lot better than today's tools um everyone on this call is going to be familiar with collaborative tools that have taken the world by storm in the past uh, 10 or so years. Um, Google Docs and the whole family with Google Slides and Google Sheets and so on. These are powerful, not just because they're web-based, but because they allow many people to, to contribute to it at once. And, um, and to 
to go and use it and, and comment on each other's contributions and not wait till it's thrown over the fence to them after someone else has finished. And really we need that for modeling. We need collaborative tools. And we've built the first generation of those, collaborative system mapping, collaborative stock and flow diagrams. Um, but we need to do a lot better. What we've done is kind of proof of concepts, um, but it's kind of a Google doc for building causal loop diagrams and, and similar diagrams for hybrid modeling and agent-based modeling and for kind of crude representation of stocks and flows. We need to build collaborative tools that can be used by all team members, interact, run it, build it, contribute to it, comment on it, et cetera. And the tools just aren't there yet. And they should be, because there's no reason not to be in this day and age of Google, Firebase, and you know the um, Amazon's comparable um, sync and uh, tools that that allow us to basically uh, support collaborative computing. Um, this should be front and center part of, of modeling because modeling is team-based. Um, but we also need supportive languages and software engineering so people can contribute different pieces of a model, not as some monolithic hairball, but as, as different pieces that can be plugged in. And any logic is singularly terrible at this. It's, it's got this kind of monolithic model that really inhibits effective um, evolution from multiple people, whether with Git or any other interface. And we know how to do better as computer scientists. I mean, it's 2021, like, like this is like technologies from the 90s that are there right now. We have to do better. And so, um, you know, we, we need these model languages and software engineering that um, are up to snuff. Um, and these will offer us, um, some amazing advantages in other areas too, including um, enhanced performance. We'll, we'll get to that. Um, but you know, you may have noted in your pursuit of problem four, or sorry, assignment four, um, that there's a real difference between agent-based modeling in even in any logic and system dynamics modeling in any logic. System dynamics is basically a declarative interface. I mean, you're basically kind of describing what the system is. You put in formulas that have to hold and you say, go figure. And, you know, it figures out the how to go integrate it. Um, you're specifying the what. This is called declarative characterization. It figures out all the little details about the numerical integration. You're not writing for loops to perform the numerical integration. The reality is for any seriously um, large is any medium or, or larger size agent-based model, any really serious uh, model of substance, you'll typically have a, a fair bit of programming that still goes into it with Java code, et cetera, for, um, for agent-based modeling. Um, and this distracts from a focus on the problem. It's, it's a bunch of trees getting in the way of seeing the forest or a bunch of weeds getting in the way of seeing the forest. I mean, it's, 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 it's um, sacrifices a lot in terms of your ability to focus on the underlying situation because you're thinking as a software engineer, you're thinking as a Java programmer instead of thinking as a modeler. And um, we need to do better and we know how to do better. I mean, computer scientists, we, we have this unique position of choosing the language we use to solve given problems. And we can build our own languages. And so we've been working towards declarative specification of ABMs. I work in this with uh, Chris Duchin, um, another faculty member, and we've done some neat work with functional reactive programming and Haskell. Um, and we have several lines of work uh, germane to this, but um, uh, the basic idea is to take ABMs into a declarative framework. Um, that's not ed, but that will take us very far so that you can characterize ABMs in this way that are um, uh, that are at once um, um, at once uh, very uh, modular, at once uh, also uh, concise, expressive, general, and uh, have a separation of concerns. That's a software engineering term. So, you know, we don't tangle up the things that are observer processes that just report on the model state. Don't tangle those up with the core logic of the model. 
um, we're not tangling up the need to show something on the screen with, you know, the 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 thing that which captures the stages of infection or something like that. Those can be should be able to be separated in different spheres so we could replace one and not not affect the other, and they to be able to be contributed by people with different expertise, like UI expertise versus um, expertise associated with infectious diseases versus people who are very knowledgeable on the data front, et cetera. Um, so we need ways of, of characterizing these models that are, that are modular, that allow this separation of concern, that are concise, expressive. Um, but we also need to be able to weave in computational effects. Like I, if I wanna be able to run a model, I wanna be able to run it probabilistically and see a distribution of outcomes, not just one outcome. I want to be able to run it in a way that logs what's going on in the model. I want to be able to run it in a way that that saves away audits or or records of each uh, each run performed. Uh, I want to be able to run it in a fashion which is uh, capturing a visualization of it as I run it, capturing this visualization or another. And we call those computational effects and. Um, uh, we can weave those into programs uh, using tools from applied category theory and, and functional programming. But um, in, in a modeling standpoint, those are, are you know, very new ideas and we, um, we are seeking to, to leverage those with some of our, our work. Um, so visualization is another key need. I, unfortunately, it's ironic, I don't have rich slides showing visualizations that we've built. We've built a lot and they are um, very insightful. Models are complex systems. <laughs> they're simplified versions of the system that allow you to experiment with it, but they're complex. And, and often visualizations, they tap into one of humans foremost assets, which is this visual cortex to understand really complex patterns visually is one of the best uses of the human brain. I mean, it's, it's, we can spot really subtle patterns. And yet most of the out data output by simulation models is traditionally in files, maybe it's in some graphs, but, but it's not really available to our visual system. So we build tools with things like the Oculus um, 3D visualization system for virtual reality, uh, or do visualization with web-based collaborative tools, interactive tools, to allow us to really understand and plot out in a flexible way um, what's going on in a model, to really give us a better understanding of what's transpiring in the model and by extension, what might be transpiring in the world. Now, another thing though associated with these languages and frameworks is the potential for capturing not just basic software engineering practices. I mean, mocking and testing in any logic is horrible, it's horrible. Um, I've been doing it for years and it's, it's, it's like pulling teeth. Um, and I, I mean, we got to test our models. Um, you you got to run them through in case you've made a silly mistake that totally breaks certain features and so on. But we have very poor ways of doing them. But not only can effective models and uh, languages and software engineering help with this model description and processes associated with models, and make it a lot more flexible, a lot more uh, um, decomposable. Uh, but we can also use it to enhance performance. When we characterize models at a higher level, we can transform them. We can map them onto distributed resources or parallel computing resources. One of the biggest things we've used is GPUs, uh, graphical processing units that many of you will know are, are in your uh, computers. These are designed to really speed up uh, visual rendition and are heavily used in uh, things like animation and games, et cetera. Um, but they're amazing resources for modeling. Um, uh, they'll have something like you know, 2000 cores that can each run in parallel, all doing the same basic instructions, but on different data. If you have you know, 2000 particles in a particle filter, you can run it with these these different uh, on these different GPUs and have it run in parallel essentially. There's an asterisk there at, at times of observations, but it's basically a solid idea. If you want to run a sensitivity analysis, if you want to run your model with different random number seeds, you can run it in parallel. Um, and there's a lot of opportunities for decomposing models in a concurrent way. 
taking advantage of locality. If we have agents, often those agents communicate with each other via networks or in space in ways that are local. We can take the set of agents and we can divide them up into different machines um, and have only limited communication between those machines or place them on different, different GPUs or, or different CPUs. Um, and this decomposition allows us to take advantage of parallel computing rather than going each person at a time under the covers and, and advancing them, we could advance them uh, largely in parallel with each other or large groups in parallel. This takes advantage of the fact there's very localized dependencies and things like agent-based modeling. Um, so uh, there's an impact, a large impact of language and kind of abstraction level of the framework. Uh, believe it or not, any logic is one of the higher level frameworks. We have constructs like state charts, for example, uh, or events. And traditionally, a lot of that was just done in code. Um, and you know, traditionally, agent-based models had to write their own for loop to iterate overall the overall time and then overall agents within that time. And it was brutal. These days, we can specify these things at a higher level. And using tools from applied category theory and from characterization of the models mathematically, we can recognize transformations that we can perform safely on a model, which means that we can take a given model and radically transform it into a way that can be run very quickly. And some of my students have noted huge speed ups to that. So this is uh, the amount of time it takes. It, the the, the x-axis here is different experiments. Um, the the y-axis uh, has to do with how much time, how many, what's the factor by which longer CPU takes compared to GPU? So if it takes an hour on on CPU and only a minute on GPU, these graphical processing units, they operate in parallel, it'll be a 60 times, uh, it'll be a, up at 60. So you can see here, you know, it's it's divided um, even at the lower scale, you might get two or three times, but it can go up to a factor of something like 40. Um, and in other situations, you could see just radical differences where, you know, we have the number of seconds here for a CPU is upwards of, of uh, 10,000, whereas for a GPU, it's down here in the couple hundreds, for example. Um, this, is, this is in this relative of particle filtering uh, running across with large numbers of particles. This is similar to what we run. I mean, we, we have more particles yet, but in the tens of thousands or low hundreds of thousands for COVID-19, typically 150,000, sometimes we use 75,000. Um, so you can get radical speed ups uh, by taking advantage as computer scientists of hardware. This is not something that mathematicians can easily do. It's not something that uh, you know, your person who's using the models can do, but we as computer scientists can, and we should because it helps speed up the learning and helps us uh, make these models more useful and make sure they, they get used and uh, provide deeper insights. Um, another sphere where modeling has uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of options for advancing has to do with um, representing decision-making on the part of agents. And right now, the agents we build are, are often very simple in their decision-making, but if you wanna understand decision-making regarding things like masks or regarding things like social distancing or regarding things like acceptance of a vaccine and whether someone gets you know, a booster shot for a vaccine a year from now, et cetera, um, we'd like a better way of kind of representing how do people make decisions about it because we might be able to shape those decisions through incentives or by, um, by rewarding them in some way um, through, through, uh, through, the, through the health system and um, maybe by acknowledging them, et cetera. So um, there are these tools like random utility theory that provide these frameworks uh, for representing decision-making. Um, these are from fields like marketing and so on, where companies spend a god awful amount of money to figure out, you know, how to get people to buy Listerine instead of Scope or something like that, right? Or this toothbrush instead of that toothbrush, um, this car instead of that car. And we can leverage that theory um, for agent-based modeling for things like health and, and better understand, you know, how do people make decisions? Um, 
uh, and and therefore how will we be able to nudge that? If uh, tobacco companies are advertising with coupons and and letting people buy cigarettes in large boxes, cartons, so that they can get them cheaper, um, how can we effectively counter that to lower the chance it will sway people to keep on smoking, uh, et cetera? And there's some mathematical forms of these models that have been advanced that are that are um, powerful and and practical, and we've used them in some of our work. And Kurt Kruger, who spoke with you last week on the together with Wade McDonald's on the ABM front, um, has been a pioneer in integrating these with agent-based models. Um, so um, another sphere I want to talk about, though, is, is something we've downplayed in this course somewhat, and that's participatory modeling. Okay, this is a type of modeling which, which um, this is an aspect of modeling which we practice extensively. There just wasn't time to cover it in the course. And it has to do with the fact that models are, are social constructs. They're built in a socio-technical environment. It's not just technical things, they're built in a social environment. There's a human feeder associated with their use to get a model really used. Boy, can I tell you about that in COVID-19. Um, and uh, when it comes to models, they're not built in a back office typically, you know, by someone working in, in the dark. They're, they're built in the sphere of interactions with experts, et cetera. And so it behooves us with a model because models are learning tools and we benefit from getting them critiqued and, and uh, getting suggestions, et cetera. It benefits to engage with, uh, with parties who are knowledgeable, whether because of expert education or just because they live in the system and, and operate in it, um, to engage with them early. Um, and so there's this whole spectrum where, you know, on the one hand, you can have people engage with the model once it's built and comment on it and ask how realistic it is and do you think it captures their effective ideas, to sort of situations where you bring them in partway through the project and get their comments, to situations where you have them there from the start. So for example, in some of our work, uh, this Arch Hackathon, this Addictions Recovery Community Health uh, program from Edmonton, you know, we had those with lived experience uh, living on the street and uh, of substance uh, challenges who are commenting on our models being built to describe the challenges uh, experienced by that population in care seeking. And often we begin this sort of work because of limitations of the technology. Again, I mean, if we could build software for this, it'd be so much better with kind of, um, you know, very simple representations on paper and people, this is for gestational diabetes, and people put down these kind of uh, items on the paper and they link things up and they describe why they think there's a link there or, or the nature of the link. Um, and this is, this is actually a process which is, um, uh, this particular one involving a set of experts. This gentleman right here, uh, Paul Kelly, is currently the chief, the single uh, highest person in the Australia healthcare system. He's the chief medical officer of Australia, chief health officer. Um, uh, but he was an eager participant in this. We had a variety of experts from around the table. Um, in other cases, my colleagues like Peter Hoffman, um, who's at Case Western now, um, uh, you know, applies this in community settings, um, in, in high schools to deal with issues of, uh, of stress for, for high school students and bullying or in this in rural India, um, talking about environmental degradation. And they actually bring community members forward. There's actually a story here. This woman wandered in, she was looking for her husband. The group that was doing the modeling was all male. It was all this patriarchal sort of group. She wandered in and she kind of looked what was on the screen and she pointed out some gaps in it um, based on what she saw in these diagrams. Um, she said, no, you're missing this, this, this component. She hadn't been part of the core modeling team, but she was able to contribute because they were using these very visual depictions. And, and Peter's group has been really uh, quite advanced in using this in a participatory way with communities and with those li lived experience. Um, time is running out. Um, uh, I wanna make some final comments here for the class. Uh, I'll just note that there's another frontier we're working at 
with uh, where models to address privacy concerns. Uh, we have rich models using super rich data, which is encrypted. And you can actually compute on encrypted data and get a meaningful answer back that's, that in turn is encrypted um, that um, avoids needing to, to see um, all the details of the data in a way that, that would be privacy revealing. Um, okay, a few concluding remarks. Um, this class is about addressing um, something which is, is needed to address the world's most pressing problems, the science of the whole. A systems perspective um, you know, is, is something that's needed for these wicked problems that are the foremost problems in the world and that are, are typical day-to-day -day problems for businesses, for, for you know, governments, for universities, uh, et cetera. It's, it's about acknowledging and confronting these tangled systems um, and, and being willing to reason about that tangling um, as we do with this sort of model. It does require a willingness to work across the technical sphere and the human sphere. Um, I cross back and forth between them in the course of a day, GPU programming and, and you know, bits of Java code or, or bits of R code and, and machine learning. Uh, with dynamic modeling all the way to, you know, dealing with our chief medical officer. But, um, uh, you know, in, in, in your lifetimes, and particularly in the coming decade, the need and opportunity for applying these tools is growing hugely. I, I get these regular messages seeking students to, to apply things. Just last night I was on with Australia, We've hired five of our students to go over there for internships. Um, they, they want to build their team and uh, they know that our lab is is the number one place to go for for students trained in in this sort of interdisciplinary use of these sort of multiple types of models, particularly in health. Your schools as computer scientists are particularly valuable here. It takes teams to build these models, but the single biggest shortage is often the uh, the person trained with computational skills who can wield these tools with facility but still talk with people from different disciplines. And look, whether you perform formal modeling or not in the future, a systems perspective will be an asset. But if I could say you know one or two things more, it will be this perspective about uh, about being humble, about uh, understanding of the world, about seeking to always turn mistakes into opportunities to learn. Um, to turn misunderstandings or cases where we're tripped up, not use them as a, as a cause for shame or feeling bad, uh, uh, but as a question of how can I do better next time? How could I learn more effectively? How could I head this off or have disco discovered the problem sooner? If you can use that as a principle for life, regardless of whether you ever set hands again, on a dynamic model in its formal way, uh, I feel this course will uh, advance you and you'll do very, very well in life. Because it's this commitment, whether in model form or person form, to always uh, cross-checking ourselves and quickly identifying you know, if we're off base and working to, to do better, um, that, that really will allow for for growing to address the foremost challenges of the world, whether at a personal level or at a societal level. Um, I hope I've given you today, you know, a brief glimpse of some dynamic modeling frontiers that, um, that make this field uh, a foremost one in terms of uh, speed of progress and in terms of potential for informing things. It's been my great pleasure to have you in this class. Uh, I've really enjoyed my interactions with you, including uh, in, in office hours um, and in projects. Uh, I look forward to future interactions. I'm always glad to speak with students if, if you are interested uh, in learning more. Um, I will be holding office hours immediately after this class. I'll be holding the two review sessions for the exam and uh, if there is demand, I'll hold additional office hours before the exam as well, so you can kind of come on a, on a, a smaller scale basis. Um, but thank you very much for your attention during a very difficult semester, a very difficult time, and in the context of uh, the sizable load that you folks are juggling atop on this very, you know, um, le less than optimal type of distance-based interaction. 
Um, be sure to fill out the course evaluation. It expires tonight, I think, is what I was told last night. So if you haven't done it already, please do so. I'm, I'm always interested in student feedback so we can do better next time for that philosophy that I, uh, that I articulated. So thanks so much, stay safe, uh, and I hope you secure some benefit from the material conveyed in this course. Good luck to you and uh, all the best.